Good afternoon. This is DK from Mr. V Amps, and today we're going to talk about essentially the first and still to this day most accurate instrument tuning system developed in 1938 by Kahn Laboratories. That's the same Kahn that makes saxophones and trumpets and whatnot. The original device was called a Strobocon. You're looking at a Strobocon. Later they introduced a smaller version called the Strobo Tuner. They all work on the same principles. We're actually going to discuss these principles, how these devices work, and this technology is still being used today as the most accurate way to tune any of your instruments. How this works is absolutely fascinating and brilliant. It's going to get a little technical and boring, but we'll try to make it entertaining. If we're going to go back in time and discuss and read some original literature about these devices, I think we need to figure out how to do it in an authentic 1940s, 50s educational film voice. Ooh, I don't know if I have one of those. Okay, before we really start delving into and looking at these devices and all of this kind of stuff, um, we'll actually look at the principles of operation on how a spinning disc with lights behind it can actually tune an instrument more accurately than a majority of all of these electronic doodads we have today. Into the past. Dun, dun, dun. Okay, when we start going through the documentation, they're going to talk about a thing called a wagon wheel effect. And if you've seen an old movie, like an old western movie, you know what they're talking about. But we're going to demonstrate it here with a large computer fan. This computer fan will rotate counterclockwise. So we'll put a little bit of voltage on it. There it goes counterclockwise. But when it hits, as you can tell as the RPM varies, based on the camera's ability to pick it up on a certain number of frames a second, you can actually see the center looks like it's going clockwise, not counterclockwise. And this is a strobe effect based on the number of times that your eyes can perceive. And at certain points, as I run through the different speeds of the fan, it looks like it's either rotating clockwise or momentarily comes to a stop. It looks like it's stopped right there on the outside and now it's going, you know. So because my power supply isn't incredibly accurate, because it's really old, our channel has no money, I think you should make a donation. <clears throat> now, uh, this type of strobe effect is what is used to make the Strobocon and the early Con strobe devices work. Okay, so we've demonstrated that. Now let's go look through the documentation. The method of measurement employed in the Strobocon is stroboscopic in nature. A familiar example of the stroboscopic phenomenon is the one often seen in motion pictures where a wagon wheel appears to stand still or move backward while the vehicle is moving forward. Movie film is projected at the rate of 24 pictures per second, and because the eye is unable to resolve each picture at that rate of speed, a continuous motion is seen. However, when the spokes of a wagon wheel in motion are revolving at such a speed that 24 spokes per second pass any given point, the eye no longer sees motion, but an apparently motionless wheel. If slightly less than 24 spokes per second pass at any given point, the wheel appears to rotate slowly backward. Similarly, slightly more than 24 spokes per second will cause an apparent slow forward rotation. A wheel in motion appears stationary only when the rate at which the pictures are projected exactly equals the product of the number of spokes multiplied by the number of wheel revolutions per second. In the Strobocon, a neon discharge tube is made to flash in accordance to the pulsations with the sound reaching its microphone. The light from this tube is used to illuminate the series of 12 rotating discs which have been imprinted with a pattern such as seen in figure 4 consisting of 7 rings of alternative light and dark segments that correspond roughly to the spokes on a wagon wheel. Each ring progressing radially from the center has exactly twice the number of segments from the preceding one just as musical notes double their frequencies in progressing to successfully higher octaves 
An example of how the Strobocon operates, the 16-segment ring of Strobocon in the key of C, a disc appears stationary when rotating of a speed of 25.5 revolutions per second and illuminated by light flashes occurring at a rate of 440 per second. This is a picture of the con strobe disc that actually makes this whole system tick and the strobe disc is still used today and manufactured today the technology is now in the possession of peterson the strobe tuner company so um old invention still used if you notice the number or the ratio of black to white on the disc uh, doubles each ring from the center to the outside so in the center there are essentially two black spots on the next ring out there's four then eight then sixteen etc and that has to do with the different octaves in instrument tuning 440 hertz is our standard a pitch that most of us tune to and if you start to divide that down 220 hertz is a octave below 110 is another octave down and then 55 is another octave down that's about the lowest a that we would use on a piano 55 hertz is significant because it's very close to 60 hertz which is a common electric motor the Strobocon uses an AC synchronous motor that could run on anywhere from 50 to 60 hertz and if we can give it a perfect 55 hertz an A pitch it will actually run at a precise speed for all the note tuning. Essentially an octave is half the frequency up and down the scale either half or double the frequency so if we can get the gear ratio correct and get the disc to spin at the proper RPM for a given note, we can tune every note in the scale and the full range of a piano. The tuning unit of the Strobocon houses an extremely temperature stable Conovar tuning fork. At the zero setting of the tuning unit, this fork vibrates at 55 cycles per second, and this is used to control the frequency of the power supply to the synchronous motor that drives the 12 stroboscopic discs in the scanning unit. Two sliding weights operated by the tuning knob vary the normal 55 cycle per second rate of vibration of the fork to a calibrated range of one semitone, and in this turn varies the speed of the scanning disc in the motor in direct proportion. Thus, some combination of disc, pattern, and speed rotation can be found to correspond within one one-hundredth part of a semitone as found in the equally tempered scale to any frequency from 31.772 to 4066.8 cycles per second. This is the inside of the tuning unit, which is the lower unit on a Strobocon. You'll see there is a large tuning fork there and it is excited by some little electrical coils. The slide weights will adjust your 55 hertz. Those 55 hertz are fed into a audio amplifier that sits behind there and you can actually see on another video where I took one apart. Unfortunately the camera for that was kinda garbage. But that signal coming off the tuning fork once it's set to 55 Hz is broadcast loud enough through the amplifier to drive a synchronous AC motor. A synchronous AC motor will change its speed and lock into a specific speed based on the frequency that it is fed. Most of our AC synchronous motors we run at 60 Hertz out of the wall they're perfect for turntables because they maintain an accurate speed in this case we are lowering that speed to 55 Hertz that of a very low A okay we'll now demonstrate how to power up a Strobocon correctly your controls on here is you have your input which is good for an instrument that will that has a high impedance like a guitar um, you have a gain control volume knob sensitivity, I guess you'd say, of your microphone, which I do have our microphone here. We'll bring that down here. We have the switch here that goes from warm up to run. I think it says motor run. And then we have our main power switch. So we'll leave this in the warm up position and flip the power switch to on. The discs up here begin to run, and we wait. And it clicks and clacks while it warms up the vacuum tubes in the audio amplifier. 
in the audio amplifier there are two preamp tubes and a quadrant of 6V6s. There was an earlier model that used a pair of 6L6s as opposed to the quad of 6V6s. Now that the motor pilot light has come on, which is the glowing orange neon light you see there, that essentially means the audio amp is warm enough to produce a signal and we can flip from the warm-up position to the motor run position. This will fire the preamp up in the top unit and it will take a moment to warm up and then at that point the unit should be listening for tones and preparing to tune. Uh, we would want a reference pitch. As you can see as I'm talking the microphone can hear me and the, the neon lights are kind of beginning to flicker. We would want a reference pitch for this unit. That could be a preferred tuning fork, but I'll tell you, once you have one of these, you realize how much different tuning forks vary. So I usually ask, if I'm doing somebody's piano, I ask for their tuning fork that they want that piano tuned to. Or you can use a standard reference pitch. I do have a tuner here that emits a good A frequency. I'll turn that down so the lights quit flicking and I'll zoom in on our scale up here. See if we can do this without crashing the camera. Okay, that's all the farther this goofball will zoom in because it doesn't have a lot of zoom. But our windows here are labeled C, C sharp, D, D sharp, E, F, F sharp, G, G sharp, A, A sharp, and B. So I will play a reference pitch A into the microphone and it looks really good. The A strobe appears to be moving just a hair, saying that my calibration might be just off a minuscule amount. That looks perfect. I'll try to move the tripod in close so you can see that. Okay, so we've got an extreme close-up as best I can do here. Um, so our A window is this one right there. And hopefully you'll be able to see the strobe when we play the A pitch into it. There we go. I think that looks good on camera. The intensity of the signal will affect the intensity of the neon. So we want to adjust that so you can see, but it should appear that the A itself is not moving. And that is an A in the fourth octave, so it is the fourth ring down from the inside that we are paying attention to. That is a 440A, and it is stopped dead. Actually all of the octaves appear to be stopped dead for A, so that's we're all calibrated and perfect and good to go. Okay, I'm not a thousand percent sure how well the guitar is going to be able to read this, but I'm going to tune a guitar in real time here. So we're going to first try to do the high E, so we'll look at the E. When we strike that, it appears to be rolling, well, it looks like it would be rolling clockwise, or the the blocks are moving to the left, indicating that the note is flat. So we'll attempt to tighten up our high E string just a little bit until they stop. We have to go very, very slowly because it takes nothing to get going too high. We're actually just ever so slightly moving sharp but we're talking a thousandth of a cent. I mean, not even. Let's try the low E. The low notes are sometimes a little bit fizzier to read on the scale, but we'll look for the low E. You can see it in the lower octave at the top of the wheel. And we've got that one zeroed in pretty well. Guitars. Let me see if I can lighten up the guitar's input to make the best image for the camera. 
with my eye, I can see it very, very well. That looks good. Next we'll move to the B, which is over here on the scale. High note. And that is running significantly flat. So we'll snug that up. And now it is dead on, guts on perfect. This is the G, right there. Which is slightly, slightly sharp. And that appears to be nearly perfect. When you first strike the string, it actually wants to go a little sharp, and then as it rings out, it might go flat on you a little bit. Kind of the nature of a guitar, they're never perfect. D. Showing a little bit to the flat side. The changes I'm making to this guitar are minimal. This guitar actually sounded in tune to me prior to picking it up. I have the guitar plugged directly into the Strobocon for the most accurate readings. Okay, and we've, now we're to the A, which is over here. And that one appears to be spot on. So our guitar should be in tune now. So let's listen to it and see how it sounds. Okay, amplifiers hooked up and we have the guitar. We're going to just try a number of chords and hear if they all sound in tune. This guitar was intonated and all of that with a Strobocon. So we'll start with D. A. the ones that always seem out, like B minor, F sharp minor, try F sharp major, slide that up a little bit to G sharp major, C sharp minor, So, I mean, as you can tell, this is very, very in tune um, for, for being what it is, a typical off-the-street guitar. So, um, extremely accurate tuning. You do a piano with one of these, it will absolutely sparkle. No rock and roll right now. We have one more unit to cover. The Strobocon device that we looked at was extremely successful and was actually modified for other uses. There are pamphlets and booklets for industrial uses where you can listen to the pitch of a motor spinning at a specific RPM and use it to synchronize all of the units so they run the same. This was actually used on airplane engines in World War II, a music company helping tune up airplane engines. Go figure. Well, a little bit later, they came up with the Con Strobo Tuner. I fixed uh, quite a few of these on my site, so if you're not familiar with them, you can look around through those. This is an ST2. It's one of the earlier ones. They also used a crystal high-voltage microphone. I've got some cables in the way there, but it's an EV915 uh, crystal mic. Very high-impedance microphone. Works great with these. And for a reference with these, instead of having 12 motors on, or I'm sorry, 12 discs on a single motor with a gear ratio to vary the speed of said motors, they electronically vary the frequency. There are transformers and capacitors in there that can together vary the frequencies. I don't really want to go into the eccentricities of it, but by all means, if you want to start looking at schematics, we'll look at schematics. These show up a lot more often on the market. Almost every 
band room back in the day had them. This one runs on one, two, three, four, five vacuum tubes? Five vacuum tubes? Five, six. Six vacuum tubes in this one, as opposed to 13 in the Strobocon, and actually 11 in the earlier model. But with these units, it uses, for a reference pitch, you could either use your tuning fork or reference pitch like I did, or you can use the signal from the wall. Since the 60 hertz from the wall is very consistent, we can actually use that to adjust our lowest octave, and then it will begin processing that 60 hertz through a series of transformers and capacitors to change that frequency to the desired frequency to control the RPM of the single motor. This knob over here is for adjusting that. You need to have the unit in the calibrate mode down here, and then you can turn this knob until essentially that one black dot that's on the lowest octave right there. As soon as you can get that to stay in one spot, you've got it, and I've almost got it. It's creeping ever so slowly, and now it's going to creep the other way. And you can do this till kingdom come, and you'll probably never get it to stop a thousand percent, but that is so close it's going to count. At that point I'm going to put my needle at zero, in case I want to do a um, tempered tuning to a piano where I would want to go 10 cents sharp on the high end and 10 cents flat on the low. And then we can place it into operating mode, and now it is listening for our signal from our microphone or from our guitar. We also have a gain, which is how much the microphone is sending signal in. If I turn that up, you can see this flicker as I talk. These also function in an opposite fashion of the Strobocon, where the Strobocon will turn the neon bulbs on when it hears sound, where this one will flash them to the off position when it hears sound. But otherwise, it still works in the same general functionality. You also have all of your notes outlined here. You have from, well, the whole scale. You have your A all the way around to your G sharp. So you have to specify to the strobo tuner which note you are trying to tune so it can accurately adjust the motor speed accordingly via its network of transformer and capacitor. These devices are much easier to carry around if you were a traveling organ technician, which is where a lot of these come from, or piano tuner. Extremely popular device. These were developed sometime probably in the early 50s, I believe, were the first ones to come out. And the device was produced up until a, probably the 70s when they introduced the ST11, which was their first solid state portable. It cut the size and weight down by half. So we'll look a little bit at the legacy of uh, some of these units, but I wanted to cover the oldest of the old because essentially these things are unchanged. The original Strobocon that we have over there um, is was the same from 1936 through 1968, I think is when they stopped producing it, something like that. 68, 69, they, they produced them a long time. And these units were the same from the 50s till the late 60s. The ST Model 6 is actually associated with Jimmy Page from Led Zeppelin, who carried one around on tour, and I've covered some pictures of that in a few other uh, videos that we've done. So just a brief look at the Strobo Tuner, the miniature version, and hopefully you have an idea of how these strobe tuners work now. They're just really fascinating, cool devices, and if you want to improve your tuning, get yourself a strobe. And not even the new, there's a new version, the LCD strobe that Peterson's putting out. It's a nice try. Get one with a disc. Get an old school vintage one like this if you can find them at an affordable price, or find a newer one. There's lots of the solid state models that Peterson put out from the 60s and 70s, but an electromechanical disc strobe tuner is by far the most accurate method of tuning a piano, a guitar, and anything. Once you've tuned with one of these, you're not going to want to switch out. However, having to rotate all the darn discs around to set all your notes is a pain in the rear.
So thus, I love the big StroboCon, and we keep that mounted to the wall in our studio. There are other model tuners, like uh, the Node, or there's a Peterson Strobe Center that is a 12-disc current production, but I don't think any of us have seven or $8,000 to buy one. I think the last time I looked, I think they were like at 5500 on sale. So keep your eye out on for these. Um, I might even sell you one if you contact me. I don't think I want to sell this one though. I do have other ones. I get them in from time to time. Whenever I find them, I fix them and we sell them. All right, that's enough strobe tuner talk. I wanted to show you guys how they work and what makes them tick. Hopefully you have a better idea. Have a great day.